Good evening, everyone. John Henry Soto here. Welcome to JHS Interviews. Tonight, I have a very good friend of mine. Uh, Michael Simon Hall is going to be here, and uh, he actually has uh, some really, really exciting news, some good stuff coming up. Um, I'm really excited to talk to him, so I'm just going to bring him on because you know what happens. I start yap yapping and yapping, uh, so we're just going to bring him on. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Michael Simon Hall. All right. <laughs> we need like a huge a huge audience and huge applause and you know the whole the band coming on and everything just imagine that happening and then <laughs> and then we're good <laughs> how you doing michael <laughs> hey hey john good 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 so how's the the signal i know we got a little bit of a, of a rush start uh towards the end here but um we didn't get to really check the sound anything but the sound is okay does it sound okay you were you were lagging a little bit um, okay. Yeah, yeah I, I see don't know if like, it's my connection or not. Yeah. Um, well, we'll uh, we'll go slow and just be conscious of that, and we'll just bring the energy up and just can just handle the connection ourselves. Um, <laughs> so. Yeah. 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 Okay. Michael, thank Good. you so much for being here. I uh, appreciate uh, you taking the time to talk to yeah. us. Um, I'm really excited. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't get a chance to see the uh, the HBO. Um, the HBO show, but I did so. I did see the trailer. Uh, was the only thing I got to to get, and the trailer looked fantastic. I mean, what a what a story! I mean, wow, you know. And um, you played Stuart Feinstein, yeah, yeah, I yeah. believe. Yeah. So so tell me a little bit about yeah, I'm that. I'm sorry, I, you, I like? couldn't hear you for a sec. You said you saw the trailer. Is that what you said? Yes. Yes. Uh, hold on one sec. Let me see if I can. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. So, sure. yeah, tell me a little bit about what that experience was like. Oh, it was amazing to work. You know, it's an honor to work with Mark Ruffalo, for sure. Um, and, um, you know, I play, I, I mean, I don't want to give it away for people that haven't seen it yet. If, you know, sure. it's, um, I'm in the fifth episode of, of, of the six episodes. And um, I play a little Oops, I lost you for a second. Yeah, I think your, signal, your signal is a little uh, coming in and out. I don't know if, uh, are you on your computer? Is my signal coming in and out? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm on my laptop. It's a Wi-Fi, right? Yeah, yes, it is. Okay. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Let's hope it gets better. Yeah, so I play his lawyer. I play, I, I not play his lawyer. I'm trying to, I am, I won't give it away too much, but I'm, I'm a prospective lawyer of his, and he's, he's looking for assistance to get uh, Mark Ruffalo to get his, um, to help with uh, his twin brother uh, get some justice. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. And I'm not the nicest lawyer. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I am almost a, you know, kind of the lawyer that you try to avoid. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but it was, you know, it's great working with him and, um, also with Derek C in front. Um, and, uh, you know, we had a script and, uh, what, what ends up in the, in the episode is really sliced down. It's not the full, it's not everything we shot. And that rarely happens. You know, it's, it's not uncommon that it gets sliced down. I was just very happy that it was in there at all. Because you seriously, when you're a supporting character, you never know what's going to be cut or not cut, and you might think that your plot point is important, <laughs> but you cannot assume that. You know, you cannot at all. So, um, so I was, I feel, I'm very happy that it's in there, and um, and uh, it was a great experience because you know Mark is as nice a guy, as down to earth as you would hope he would be. Just the feeling that you get. I think generally when I, you know, it was, it was very pleasant and, um, and also Derek, the director. And um, when we were rehearsing, you know, we had a little rehearsal, we did a lot of improv and I, I like that a lot. So what ended up in the final cut is actually half improv, half scene. Wow. It's kind of a mix, you know, and, uh, and that's the way he likes to work. If you've heard, um, 
you know, Juliet Lewis, who's a wonderful act. Um, by the way, the ensemble is outstanding in this. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, not talking about myself, but <laughs> everyone else in this project. I mean, Bonnie Timmerman, the casting director, she's a pro. And just, the, you know, just the opportunity to work with her when she called me. And I'm like, wait a minute, Bonnie, Bonnie Timmerman. It's like, why does that name sound familiar? And I'm like, she was, she was, I mean, she's sort of like, uh, I think she went through a little bit of a break, but I mean, she she was a very huge in the 80s and 90s. Mm -hmm. And now she's doing more independent films and uh, such a nice lady. And um, just an honor to be called in by her to begin with. And then to be able to work with, oh, I was saying about Juliette Lewis. I mean, the point is Bonnie created this, uh, an amazing ensemble of actors, Laura Esterman and and uh, this guy, Philip Ettinger, who plays the younger version of Mark Ruffalo when he's a young man. And he also has to play twins. You see, Mark plays twins in this. Right. And he actually had to gain 30 pounds and he had to take six weeks off to in between to gain the weight back. And because um, he started off on the slim side and then he gained the weight. And then this young guy, um, a wonderful actor, Philip Ettinger, plays the younger version of him when he's in like high school and to college age. and. Uh, and he's, I mean, this is like a breakthrough role for this guy. Check this guy out, Philip Ettinger, and um, just great. And then Juliet Lewis is great as always. She's so electric and so alive, so present. And um, she talks about how they did a lot of improv and half of what ends up in her. She has one huge scene uh, and Derek likes to do long scenes and tries not to, if he can, not cut things a lot um, and get like one long, get long takes. Yeah. And she they have a brilliant scene together, her and Mark. And um, she talks, she shares in an interview. A lot of that was improv. Uh, she ended up getting locked in a bathroom during the, the blocking. And that wasn't supposed to happen. And they're having a fight. And then so she just went with it and they kept on rolling. And she's locked in the bathroom screaming, I'm locked in the bathroom. Let me out. And it's just so great. I mean, I don't I shouldn't have said that. I'm. I'm you know, I should have let people <laughs> discover that. But anyway, no, it's all good. It's so, all good. Um, <laughs> but it's really, a, I just admire the ensemble work. There's a great actor, Joe Giraffi. Uh, Giraffi. Did you lose me? No, I got you. Hey, John, did you lose me? Nope. I okay. hear you. I hear you just fine. There's also one, there's these wonderful little gems of work. Okay. There's another great actress. Uh, Laura Esterman has this beautiful little role and she's, she has a few short scenes, but she just is so striking in those moments. Um, and then also you have, uh, of course, Rosie O'Donnell is great and she has a large role in the piece and, and it's just a great ensemble. That's so fantastic. Um, so let me ask you um, when you're working on, on a project like that, um what what is your viewpoint on can you can you hear me did i lose you michael michael all right so we had a little bit of a rush start when we did this and uh, we didn't connect the signal as strong and there he goes all right well that's it pretty exciting i'm gonna actually flash up the uh this is actually the HBO show called I Know This Much Is True. And uh, hi. And so he's actually uh, um, had his, uh, uh, I guess, episode five he mentioned. And so he got to actually meet with or work with him, actually, with Mark, which was pretty, uh, pretty cool, actually. For that. And hey, I was holding it, holding it down. <laughs> are you back? Hey, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. All right. Yeah, I'm here. So, so where were we? Yeah, so I was going <laughs> to ask you. Um, yeah, I was going to ask hmm? you, like, when you're working with on a project Sorry? like that, uh, when you're working on a project like that, what what's it, uh, you know, what what's your preparation for that? What's, you know, what's your, your, how you actually, you know, get yourself revved up for something like that? Because, it's a pretty, it's a pretty big set. It's a pretty, you know, it's, it's, you have like a, a listers on, on set there. Um, what's your process on that? Mm -hmm. So 
Sorry, John, we're having trouble again, I think, here. Uh, let me see if there's a you, better connection that I can get. You can use your cell phone. Okay. Well, you could use the cell phone. Um, but this is uh, what I normally do is I try to get people to come in and uh, not his fault. You know, he, we just had a little technical things, but um, normally at 9.20, 9.15, so we can just check the sound to make sure we have a good connection. But here he is again. Let's rock and roll. Let's All right. I think I'm hey. here. John? Okay. Do you do you want to try to use your cell phone? That sometimes works if you if you caught any of that. We might have to do a second interview, <laughs> which is all good because I got time. All right, so um, I guess I can uh, just briefly. Uh, are you there? Oh, so Michael, do you want to try to use your cell phone? I don't know. Let's see. Uh, let's try it one more time. I'm trying to adjust my settings. I'm hoping it might make a difference here. Okay. I got two. Did you log in again? I got two of you now. <laughs> oh, sorry. Here, let me just. Yeah. All right. There we go. Two things here. Okay. <laughs> it's two Michaels. Okay. Jeez. Okay. <laughs> I guess I have to get a landline. Yeah, the Wi-Fi sometimes it's a little tricky. So what I usually okay. do, I'll, I'll say if if your cell phone is working, maybe you can do that. But let's let's give this a shot. If you want, if you think it's easier, if you think it's better, I'll go onto my cell phone. Do you have an iPhone? Yeah. Do you want to try that? Yeah, if, if it's an iPhone, you use your iPhone. It? That might be good, yeah. It's not an iPhone, it's an Android. Okay, well, it might. It still might be good if it's a, a, a good Android. I have a I have a good Android, so I can do stuff with it's it. It's a good Android, I think. Okay. <laughs> do you, want to, you, want, you want me to try that right now? Try it now. Let's mm -hmm. see what, it, what it's like. And don't worry about it. We got time to... So should I log off of this? Yeah, why don't you do that? And then I'll just talk a little bit about about stuff while you do that. Sure. I'll log, I'll log you off of this and you just... Okay, I'm going to log off of that. All right. All right. So um, technical issues happens. Uh, I apologize to everyone. Um, let me see. I got some people here. Android should work. You're right. Thank you, Sean. Android should work. Um so I had a quick experience. Uh, I probably won't get to the end of the story, but I will eventually finish it. But I did go to HBO and audition a couple of times at HBO for a couple of shows. And the uh, excitement of HBO is pretty is pretty intense. And the people were incredibly nice. I mean, they were just so supportive. And, you know, when you audition for places like that, like HBO and, um, you know, all the, the, the big network shows, when you get there, it's it's much different than when you're auditioning for, like, you know, anything, any, pretty much anything else. There's no three people sitting behind a table and, you know, there's, they don't really do that too much there. They basically, you come into an office and you just meet with somebody and you sit down in a, on a nice couch and they'll offer you water and you sit down and you have a really cool conversation about stuff. And, uh, it's, it's pretty interesting, uh, uh, experience nerve wracking, but they make it so relaxing over there when you're at that level that it, it just makes you feel really good. And, um, we talked a little bit about this with the, um, I think with uh, with Carlis on Saturday. You know about how when you get to those bigger uh, projects, you know the people that are working at those projects, they're just so professional and they're so cool that it makes it a pleasure to be there. So, um, okay, so Michael's trying to come back here. Let's see if this works. Fingers crossed, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, let's see. Hmm, no picture at all now. Michael. So um one of the things I think I'm gonna have him do is if uh, we can't get a signal, we'll just get uh the voice and I'll have him call me. I've done that in the past when people have had 
signal issues. It's happened before in the past, so um, nothing too. There he is. Hey, how is this? You look better. I look better. It's a, okay. Good. Yeah, it's actually clearer. You're not blurry. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> It's good, good. So let's let's jump right in again. Um, my my question, my last question was that you know when you're in, um, you know when you're auditioning for something like that, or when you when you're being called in for a project like that, what's your process like? You know when you're preparing for something like that, especially when you book it, you know then you kind of like you have to really kind of get into a mindset of where you're going to be and who you're going to play with, and you really got to get into present time on on something like that. What what what's your process when you're working on something like that? Well, uh, you know, you have I have plenty of time to. It's just uh, this is one scene and uh, a few pages long, and uh, so I had enough time to, you know, I had a f several weeks to learn my scene, you know, and basically, you know, obviously you come very prepared and you're off book, and you are um, you explore all the, you know, all the various imaginary circumstances of that character and all the different ways maybe that I, this could be approached within the context that we're dealing with. It's set in the night in the nineties and I'm a small town lawyer in this little place upstate New York. And, um, and, you know, you take it from the material from the text, of course, is your, is your guide. Right. And you get the idea of what this guy is like. And, um, so you, anyway, you do a lot of preparation and then, but when you come in, you have to be willing to throw that all away and you come in and you got to, you know, get in communication with your, with the environment that you're going to be working in. I had, a, you know, I had a little while they're setting up cameras. I have time to walk around and we were shooting in an actual lawyer's office, a real lawyer. And the lawyer was there. It's funny. It's very, you know, yeah. the way Derek likes to work. It, from what I understand, and in, in this movie, there are hardly any sets. It's all actual locations. Oh, that's so and cool. Sometimes yeah, it was going so well. I think we got cut up. The where we it was an actual local lawyer's office, and he had been practicing there for maybe thirty years. Him and his wife, and they were in the other room. And this is his office. <laughs> it looks like it's been there. I mean, the artist, when you walk in there, you feel like you're in the 80s or the 90s. Okay. And that's the time period is the 90s. And so wow. that was great. And that gives you so much to work with, just being in that environment. You know, and I, sure. I get down, I get in communication with, with my desk and my materials. And, you know, what would it be like to work in this space mm -hmm. and to have this space be mine? And then, and then the, while they're setting up the cameras, and it was very cramped. We had three cameras, like they were right down below me, like right over here. Three cameras mm -hmm. or two cameras mm -hmm. down there. And this is shot in actual film, not digitally. Oh. So, and it was very cramped and Derek is right off. It was a small room, wasn't big, so it was quite cramped, but, um, but that's a reality that you deal with a lot. And then, you know, me and, uh, the thing is, you come in prepared, and then you got to be ready for anything. And it, there is, there's always an aspect of improv that can happen at any time. And you really got to work off your other actor, you know, Mark. And we we talked, we we chatted about the scene, and we improved a lot. We created a whole uh, beginning of the scene that wasn't actually there to help get us like up and running. Uh, because where the scene starts is we're in the middle of the conversation already, but. We mocked mm. it up. He enters and we talk. Say hi. How are you? Take a seat, um, Mr. Birdsey, uh, Dominic Birdsey. My name is Stuart Feinstein. How can I help? And that's the way we kind of felt we wanted to do it. And also, Derek encouraged that. You know, so we take obviously. I'm taking my lead off of Mark, and. And and off of Derek, so and I I loved it and that's great and so then and we lose you again. It was going so well. All right.
Hmm. I'm going to ask him one more question when he comes on to see. Maybe he's on the Wi-Fi on his phone, which happens also. All right. Well, this is called dead air. So I'm going to actually uh, just jump in and, um, you know, he said something interesting I was going to bring up. You know, when you go into a scene, you have to come with all the stuff that you've been preparing for. You know, you have to kind of throw it out the window. Uh, you have to be ready and willing to kind of throw it out the window because the director might, they might have had a conversation that morning that wanted to change certain things. And then you show up on set and you're like ready with your script and you're like, I got everything memorized. And then I go, yeah, we actually changed half that script. So here's a new half and, you know, um, go learn this and come back, you know. Um, so that that becomes always a, an extreme uh, challenging thing, you know. Um, so let me see. He's coming back in here again. You're back. <laughs> so can I ask you another question on your phone regarding your phone? Can you hear me? Okay. Well, um, so you have to kind of throw things away because the director that day might have had a conversation or one of the actors uh, had a, a conversation with the, with the director and then they changed the whole scene around. Um, you know, I've been on sets where I was supposed to play one character and they switched me to another one. So... <laughs> So you're just like, wait, you go, oh, yeah, John, you know, this happened to me once uh, on something. And they said I was going to play a, a a cab driver or something. And I was all dressed up like a cab driver, you know, I don't know, just whatever I thought a cab driver would look like. And then I went to wardrobe and they said, hey, that looks pretty good. Oh, here he is again. Hey, hey. hey let me let me ask you, are you connected? Is your phone connected to Wi-Fi as well? Yeah, yeah. And I don't know, normally have this problem. I'm sorry, John, about this. Okay. Um, but I, I logged off, logged back on. I guess that helped. So yeah, if you could also, if you wanted to log off the Wi-Fi and just use your regular data um, stream, that might work. But let's let's continue now, oh. anyway. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not. I mean, I'm on my mobile network. I'm sorry. I'm not on Wi-Fi. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Good. All right. Yeah. Good. Good. All right. So um, we were talking about sometimes you go on set. You had said something interesting that I, I thought was interesting. You know, when you go on set. And all the stuff that you just prepared for, sometimes the director decides they're going to do something different and you show up and you have to kind of be prepared for that. You know, um, this industry is not really uh, it's not really as stable when you get there because you never know what's going to happen. You have to be always prepared for whatever comes. Yeah, um, yeah it's true. It's yeah. very true. You have to be very self-sufficient. You have to yeah. be totally ready for anything and you have to have done enough preparation that you can be flexible so that you're not thrown you know that things could change but rarely is i think is a director really going to complete i mean depends on how you look at it but they may change slightly um things that change don't really change necessarily the basic intention of the character and what you know like i've i've had i mean i just completed i did a feature film now which is hopefully going to be have a distribution deal very shortly and um we shot some scenes uh where we did the same scene but we completely changed the environment we completely changed the location oh wow and it kind of threw me we we're supposed to be at first it threw me um i mean thinking before i got to set before we got there it says mike we're not shooting uh this scene is supposed to happen in a store, but we're going to shoot it at a boat yard instead. And I'm like, okay, a boat yard. Okay. You're going to be on a boat. You're going to be on a yacht. And I'm like, okay. And I'm like, and, and, I, and I didn't, at first I was thrown, but then when we talked through it on the, you know, before we got there, I'm like, I realized that the point is it's the intention of the scene and what the scene is there to communicate. What is the purpose of that scene? Right. And the dialogue was almost, the dialogue was slightly altered. I got a rewritten scene. And, but the point is it's posted, it's there to demonstrate the relationship and a plot point in the film and a relationship between me and this other character. And so, right. and that's what you need to focus on. And how do you deliver that? Yeah. On, yeah. on my character had a, a boat and he was fixing his boat. 
and that was became part of the scene. But that's really not really what the scene is about. It's about, I mean, it's about revealing a plot point, and it's about the dynamics of like in that particular scene. It's a it's about the dynamics between me and this other character who's trying to get. Um, I'm withholding something from him and he's trying to find out what's going on. Hmm. And anyway, I won't, I, it's, it's a, it's a thriller called women and uh, that's an exciting project. And oh, um, awesome. yeah. And um, by an Icelandic filmmaker, his name is Anton Sigurdsson and a wonderful uh, uh, filmmaker. And um, so fingers crossed, good things are going to happen with that. Yeah. And, um, but anyway, yeah, it's it's different than like say being on stage. Just to make a little bit of a comparison, it's like, and this is one of the things that I had to when I started to do. I only started doing film uh, screen work only about five years ago. I was doing mostly theater my whole life, right? And so, you get used to being when you're on stage. The stage, I didn't realize how comfortable. Like when I'm on a stage, any stage, big or small, fancy or or simple or whatever it is, I feel at home because I've been there so long. And you're given this stable space where you can create in, whether you have an elaborate set or whether you just have a chair or, you know, it doesn't matter, but you have a space and you, and you, and you get used to this space and you, you're in communication with and you're using this space to help you tell the story and it becomes your partner sort of. Um, and so, but when you're on set, you don't have that. I mean, you, you, Obviously, you end up being on a set, but you don't necessarily know what the set's going to be, and you you have a concept of it, but that can change. And also, you don't have time to rehearse on that set. Mm -hmm. You don't have time to get comfortable with that chair, usually, to get, yeah. and you have a short amount of time to come in, and that's when your theater training can really help you be, because you understand the importance of your objects, of the things you might use in the scene, this particular glass. That glass is not going to work. Can I get a different glass? And this chair, how am I going to sit in this chair and my body's relationship to sitting in this particular chair in this moment? And those kinds of things, you have to work them out pretty quickly. Mm. And so you have to just be ready for that when yeah. you walk onto a set. And if you're lucky, like, say, in again, the, the feature that I shot last year, Hmm. It's going so well. <laughs> I was working. A good, in a, go, go. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, you're back. Gotcha. I mean, sometimes you get to work on a set for an extended period of time, I was going to say, where you get to be more and more familiar with the space. And that's great if you have that luxury and you're doing multiple scenes in the same location or in the same room or whatnot. And, um, that's, but you can't, you know, you can't count on that. So I always try to, if, you know, I ask for permission to get access to the set and to go around and really observe it and get personal with it, personalize it and make it part of the story. You know, yeah. even if it's only for me and the thing is it won't show on the camera necessarily, you won't, you, the camera won't capture a lot of things in the physical environment, but you as the actor and you as the playing that character have a relationship to that environment. And you just have to be able to quickly assimilate that sometimes, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Um, so, so do you, when, when you're on, you know, theater and film, now you said recently. I thought you would be, it would be a lot longer because you've done so much work in the last five years on film. Um, it seemed I've very, been a, yeah, I've been, I've been pushing myself hard. Yeah, know? I've seen I've seen that. Uh, that's really impressive. Um, yeah. What made you make that decision? You know, to really start hitting film work more because I know you, you well, know, like, you for a while, and uh, I know theater was like your your. I'm sure it still is your your life. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Well, it's you know. <laughs> Hey, time is fleeting, you know, and I always I always wanted to do it, but I was putting it off because I wasn't wired. I, I Again, I, I had to come to grips with the fact that I was so comfortable on stage and that I've been doing it since I was a little kid. Since I was in middle school, I was doing community theater and and I and and I never I just took it for granted. I didn't realize how safe 
generally speaking, I felt on a stage. And then it's exciting to be on a set. And it's certainly exciting, but I didn't necessarily feel comfortable there at first. And so I did a lot of background work at first. I said, well, listen, I'm going to, you know, we might as well get paid to go be on a set and be comfortable being on a set and observe how these people work. And then I ended up working on core background on several shows and for a, a while. And I'm getting to see pros do their job. And if you can assimilate that and you're smart and you really want to learn, there's a tremendous amount that you can learn by observing. Yeah. And then the directors pick up on that and they realize that you are more attentive and you're more present to what's going on. And then when there might be an opportunity for you and then all of a sudden you get featured. Yeah. And then that's and you could get upgraded that way. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, and that happened to me a few times. Um, but, you know, um, it's mm -hmm. a great learning opportunity to go onto a set um, as a, if you're totally new and do background work. And a lot of people poo poo it and say, you know, look down their nose at that. And, uh, um, you know, it's funny when I came to New York <laughs> many years ago. And I thought I was, a, already I was a serious theater actor in my mind, right? And I said, I'm not doing background work. <laughs> and I was only like 23 years old. I'm saying, I'm not doing, I'm too good to do background. <laughs> and I did it once or twice with a few friends. And then I said, I'm, you know, I'm a real actor. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and, then, and then, but then when I really looked at it, I had to put my ego aside and say, Michael, just learn about being on a set. Yeah, you know, and about being comfortable being on a set and see how they do all the things I spoke about. Yeah, and um, that I mentioned, and um, and so that's what I did. You know, yeah, I did. You know, and then oh, but what the thing is, I'm I'm sorry I didn't answer your question. I got on, I got sidetracked. You might want to <laughs> help me with that a little bit, but I'll go off. You know, whatever. But. Um, the thing is, I always wanted to, the point was I needed to get comfortable being in this environment. I had to kind of re rewire myself to some degree. And some people make the transition very easily, and it's not a big deal for them. And so I don't want to make it overly significant. I don't want to make a big, put a, say it's like a big barrier for people. Some people are totally fine with that. But it just took me a little time to, and the thing is, I needed to build up a sense of, I guess, I had tremendous admiration for film work and for film actors and for the art of film and making film and everything that goes into it, the directing and the editing and the, and, and the, the, the sound and everything. But I, I felt like I was, um, it just felt foreign to me. It didn't feel comfortable because again, because I, I'm coming into it in middle age mm -hmm. and just like someone, anybody, when you get to a certain point in your life, to open up a new chapter and to try to do something totally new could be a big thing, mm -hmm. you know, a big thing for somebody. So it was a big thing for me. But then I started to assimilate and, you know, and it's just by doing, you know, art is a craft. I mean, acting is a craft. It's a doing this. And the only way to get good is to do it. And just like getting on stage, you got to get stage time. You got to get in front of an audience as much right. as you can. Well, then you got to get on a set. You get on right. a set as much as you can. Right. You know, and you do all the you do the background work, then you start doing short films. Mm -hmm. You do the crappy short films that you don't want anyone to mm -hmm. see. Right. And then you start doing the better ones. Yeah. And you just work, 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 work. Right. And, and then I think that goes with any art really when you think about it. I mean, any artist that wants to get better at anything, you just have to do it, you know. Um, and that's kind of like the the key factor that I think a lot of people see the they see the lights and they see the glitz and they see the, ooh, uh, you know, you're on HBO, you know, but they don't see the hard work. They don't see the the behind the scenes of, you know, getting up at what, I mean, you probably had to be on set, I would say, really early, early. You probably got up at 4.30 in the morning, be there by whatever, 5.30, 6 o'clock. They don't see these, uh, these hours, you know, so I think it's a good insight for people, especially younger actors or any actors, really, because, I mean, I started very late and in, in, in for myself, too. You know, it's uh, I was playing music for many, many years. So um, right. but I think that's what makes art so exciting, that there is no age anything. You know what I mean? It's just like I want to try this now. It doesn't matter how old you are. It, it's it's just something that you want to actually uh, uh, try out. Um, do you 
do you like uh do you think you'll be doing a lot more film work or will you do back and forth theater and film oh i'd, I'd love to go back and forth that would be my dream you know that's yeah. what i would love to do i would love to yeah. you know be hopefully if things go you know you know i'm listen i'm every day i'm plugging away and even though we're in the quote unquote pause i'm working my butt off mm -hmm. and planning for the future i have several projects projects and developments i'm working on a pilot and i have something coming you know things that are being released this hopefully this feature i told you about women and also i'm going to hopefully be on the politician coming up in july that we oh. shot in, I shot that in February, just before everything shut down. I was lucky I got that in there. Oh wow! And, um, that's, cool. that's on Netflix. Yeah. Yeah, and that's with um, uh, Ben Platt, isn't that right? Yeah, Ben Platt. Yeah, he's amazing, man. He's amazing. <laughs> that dude is like ridiculous. Super uh, talent. Yeah, very. It's, very a, it's a it's an in very interesting show too. I, I actually play. I, I guess I can. Can I say what I do? I just say I play a politician on the politician. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How appropriate. Anyway. Yeah, right. <laughs> but anyway, so that's cool. that's coming up in July, I think, hopefully. Yeah. So, so let's so, talk a little bit about um, you know, the current situation and stuff, because I've always wanted I always like to get the insight on, you know, the artist and seeing what they've been working on in the middle. I know you have stuff that you're working on still developing. Um, how do you think, and this is a loaded question. I ask, I ask it and it's like, you know, answer it if you can, but how do you think the industry has, is going to shift coming out of this uh, situation that we're in? Oh, geez. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just did a, you know, I just did a wonderful little, um, uh, a virtual reading of a play with a theater company called fusion theater company. Um, that specializes in doing classical work and also opera. And we did a reading a few weeks ago and we may release it, uh, the recording of it. Um, and we did Death of the Maiden uh, by Ariel Dorfman. Uh, it was on Broadway in 1993 and it was originally in, in London, won the Olivier Award. And it's a very timely play about, um, just quickly about, about oppression and human rights and it is very timely and uh you know is this a coincidence how timely it was it's very powerful play mm. um and it was right it was made into a movie with a uh, sigourney weaver and ben kingsley like in the 90s okay and um anyway so we did this but this was an experiment this whole thing about virtual theater and i've been watching virtual theater whatever you want to call it people doing these live streams sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't and we're right. you know we're in this weird like balance between it's sort of like doing theater it's sort of like doing film you know <laughs> and and learning about this you know what works in this in in this medium like how do you deliver a story and make it and uh create the entertainment value that makes it worth seeing yeah i mean assuming the material is good but it has to do with also how you're presenting it you know, like, and when we're, you know, we're just in our homes and we're doing this with, and um, I mean, I don't know what the the market's going to hold. I mean, I, you know, I, I think, I think it's a great opportunity for people to do solo shows, you know, mm. and um, whether they're actually in their home or whether they're actually in a theater and you have cameras on them. And I think that something like that, that's going to be one of the first things that happens is these small intimate shows with maybe just one actor on stage or just a few actors uh, being live streamed or being recorded by, uh, you know, on camera from multiple mm -hmm. angles. And I think that that's, I mean, I'm sure something like this is happening right now. And I'm just, you know, I'm not totally up on everything, but you know, I know SAG just released the guidelines. Do you know about the SAG guidelines? Mm -hmm. Have you heard about that? Yeah, I saw them, yeah. I mean, they're, yeah. they're pretty, uh, <laughs> yeah, they're gonna be pretty interesting. But uh, it they they seem doable. Like it looks like it's it's uh, it's going in the right direction. Yeah. Well, you have these zones, right? Like the A zone, yeah. the B zone, the C zone, and and where you have to be tested with to be in a certain zone, how much testing you need, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, I think that's going to be okay. Unfortunately, you know, like I'm working on the show where I have to do voiceovers right now. This pilot for this children's show, and um, or this thing in development for uh, for a children's show, and they won't let us go into a recording studio. Even if I'm by myself, 
they say that we could be fined a thousand dollars even if i'm the only one in the recording booth and i'm nowhere near anybody else because when you aspire or you know you're uh, the the droplets that can go into the microphone that it can't there's no way to properly decontaminate the microphone good lord and i'm like really okay but I know I in hospitals are using this high tech uh, ultraviolet uh, technology to sanitize the room within a, within a matter of minutes, right. right? And it's good enough for a hospital. Why can't we use that kind of technology in a recording studio? Right. I'm sure it probably will be developed at some point. Yeah. Uh, so I, I actually have a recording studio now set up in my home. Wow. That's what we're. That's what I'm doing. So I can yeah. do voiceover work here, and. Um, the nice thing, though, is you see, it's, it's mainly about the, the, you know, the sectors that are going to be suffering are the ones where it's either actors speaking on stage or especially singing, because it's even more of a risk singing more, right. uh, you know, vapor going out or whatever. And so that's going to make it harder for musicals, harder for concerts and things like this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I'm sure they're going to come up with some solution. I mean, we don't have to, I mean, you know, I have ideas about what maybe they could do or not do, but yeah. um, I know at least for now that in terms of like doing motion capture, I have to do some motion capture work. We're clear to do that. I can go into a studio and do motion capture work if I'm the only one on the sound stage because it's silent. I'm not speaking. It's right. all physicality. And then they just wash after we're done the, the motion capture suit that you wear get sanitized and mm. then they probably and then they say of course they keep the place sanitized um mm. and so that's i know that apparently there's clearance to do that yeah well i yeah. have a, a a little uh just my own kind of two cents on what i think and i've spoken about this before on the show so i apologize for anybody watching that that heard me say this before but um what i think is going to happen is mm -hmm. You know, because Netflix and Amazon Prime and Hulu and all these original uh, streaming sites have been pretty much bombarded in the last, you know, three months by people just consuming all the content. You know, I mean, they're draining it dry, basically. So I'm yeah. sure that there, uh, there's going to be a lot of opportunities for a lot of independent um, writers as well, especially writers. I mean, because writers can still write right now. You know, I mean, that, that's not that that never really stopped. You know, you can continue yeah, yeah, writing. Absolutely. So yeah. I think what's going to happen is we're going to have like almost like an onslaught uh, slot of like brand new material, brand new content. And I even think that probably a new streaming site will come on the scene um, by one of these huge conglomerate. It's probably going to to just to be able to take the, the load that's going to be coming from Netflix and all these other uh um streaming mm -hmm. site so i think it's going to be very exciting i think a lot of people are actually creating and it's it's a it's one of those things that you can't stop the creator from creating so um it's one of those things where we're just gonna we're gonna see it. we're gonna, it's gonna be very very interesting um i have a couple of uh people on here that have a couple of uh this is a uh, tom who says looking good michael <laughs> <laughs> and hey, tom. Uh, <laughs> He says good insights and lots of experience would make a good workshop. Yeah, I think oh, uh, cool. we were talking about the uh, being on set and getting that experience, which I think that's really cool. Um, Maggie Hall says, I've always dreamed of being able to produce films like that, remotely asking people to film their own scene. Oh, that would be interesting. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure that something like that is probably being done, you know. Um, and Sean Manuel says, home studios which is definitely on the rise. I mean, people have uh, just been buying so much, so much stuff now and building these home studios. I think it's really, it's really the future. Um, there's so much power in having a studio and independence that brings to an artist. You can create and document it where, whenever you want. So true. Thank you, Sean, for that. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think that this is a, a new era. And, and like you said earlier about going on set and having to be kind of, a, you know, able to kind of like just kind of go with the flow and kind of like take the changes and go with it. I think an artist can really do that really well. And I think that's part of the job, you know, it's so I think we probably are going to be the ones that can take on the craziness and just kind of take it into make it into something and and uh, put it out into the world as something beautiful. I think you're right, John. I mean, it's totally right. I love what you said. You can't stop the creator from creating. Is that what you said? Yeah, <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think, you know, like a lot of people, the, the quote unquote civilians in society that don't have their nine to five jobs anymore, 
And like, you know, I'm saying to my friend, this, this is my normal life. Right. <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't have a regular schedule anyway. You know, you, I mean, my, my normal life is chaos, yeah. you know, almost chaos, you know, I mean, it's so yeah. unpredictable. I mean, normally I'd be having a lot of auditions right now. That's the only thing is, I mean, I have some self takes, but I'm lucky that I audition a lot. Okay. Yeah. Normally. And, you know, I have had very few auditions and, um, and so, but you know, other than that, it's like, and, unless I was going to be on set or I'm going to be rehearsing. You know, my schedule from week to week is very is it's it's always different, right? You know, and so like we're used to being creative, and then you and then people, if you have your survival job, whatever, you make it work and figure it out, and you're always hustling, and you know, and again, like and like that guy said, um, I'm I'm sorry, I forgot his name, but you got to have your own setup at home to some degree, at least yeah, because at, at least if you're in the film business or you want to be, you have to be able to do self tapes. And mm -hmm. you can go to someone else's place and pay them to do a professional self tape, and that's fine, and that's mm -hmm. a great way to start. But you should uh, ideally become self sufficient and set up your own self tape system, and it doesn't cost that much money. Right. And and casting directors aren't expecting you to be a professional um, uh, filmmaker. You know, as long as you follow the basic needs, you have the basic right. lighting and the basic backdrop and. Um, and you know, it's not that hard to do. And some people drive themselves nuts thinking they have to have this perfect setup and it doesn't have to be perfect, but it doesn't have, but it needs to be a certain, uh, at a, you need to have a certain criteria. But the right. thing is, again, it puts you in control, right? And you need to be in control as much as you can of mm -hmm. your career, because there's so many things that are out of our control. Yeah. You know, yeah. So, and one of the the other, um, um, I'm like Nost Nostradamus. I'm like making predictions. Like I know what I'm talking <laughs> about. But um, one of the things that I also think is going to happen or might happen is because all these casting directors now are, I think a lot of them are realizing that, you know what? I think if we did this system of auditioning, you know, 150 actors for a project and then calling 50 of them back for a, for a, a callback, again doing virtual you know but, mm -hmm. but this time you can actually talk to them and maybe direct them and then cut that down to 10 and then eventually when you're happy you go rent a studio somewhere you know you rent a you know shelter studio or something a space and you then cast your i think it's going to bring i think it's going to bring the cost down for a lot of casting agencies mm -hmm. that are realizing that this expensive office that we have opened you know six days a week um sometimes seven days a week might actually not be necessary or we might be able to share it with another casting uh company and sure. unite them because there's so much that you can do now virtually especially yeah. with this whole pandemic people have just really learned to say these things you know to to work these things out you know yeah i uh, think you're i think you're right john i mean inevitably that's the way the market goes is you try to um i mean <laughs> for better or for worse people try to push the responsibility down to the lower right. level right and it's always ends up on you know and you know like when they found out that you can do self tapes and that it might actually work they became all for it and it's right. only going to go more and more in that direction right right and, and why why should the casting directors absorb all the costs i mean like you said they're yeah. paying a monthly rent a lot of them share offices as it is i mean right. some of them share offices mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised, like you said, if they start to reduce the size of the footprint or just eliminate it altogether and work from home. Yeah. And like just like what you were saying, John, and I think that is what's going to happen. So it behooves anyone to get savvy. I mean, to, you know, and this is I mean, I don't know what else, what ground you want to cover here, John, but I just I, I felt like part of what I wanted to share, which is what we're talking about related to what we're talking about, is that. If you want to be in this business, you have to be highly self-sufficient mm -hmm. and you have to be highly self-motivated and you need to be able to take responsibility for everything in your career. And it's much more dynamic and has many more facets in it than many, than a lot of people realize who maybe are getting into it or mm -hmm. who are in the beginning of their profession. Yeah. And, and, and this is one example of it. Well, you don't. I remember years ago, and I mean, it seemed like years ago, right? It wasn't that long ago when all the self tapes started to become popular. And I remember an actor saying to me on set, like, saying, 
I don't know how to do a self tape. I'm not doing that. I'm an actor. I don't do. I don't have to. I don't know video equipment. And I'm like, well, listen. You better. You're gonna have to learn. Right. You're gonna have to confront it. Right. You know. And that whole mindset is the same mindset that keeps you alive and keeps you motivated, helps you to create new um, ways of thinking. And this is really, as an artist, is what you need and want, because so that because really the great thing about being in this business is hopefully you get to play different kinds of characters. You get to expand your viewpoint. You get to go outside your comfort zone. You get to do new things and think in new ways, mm -hmm. and and explore different parts of yourself and learn about the world. But part of that is going outside your comfort zone and forcing yourself sometimes to do things that don't feel comfortable or and, you know, and but it, it, it sort of becomes a muscle that you want to keep on strengthening. Yeah. Right? Like, look at you, John, you're an entrepreneur, right? You have all these great things going on. You have you're like the hardest working guy in like webcasting now, right? You have a webcast <laughs> every night, right? Almost. Yeah, just about. It's like four nights a week or something. Five. It's great. Six, you know? six nights. Six nights. <laughs> yeah, that's that's wild. And you've got a family, right? Yeah. And you've got and you have other businesses going on. And you're an actor, and you're like got all these balls up in the air, right? Yeah. Well, one it, of the things. Yeah, one of the things you just mentioned about the uh, being able, you know, taking confronting it, right? Like one of the reasons why I I think I, I've just done some of the stuff that I've done, and I'm because I confronted a lot of things early on that were uncomfortable like you know i'm a short puerto rican from the bronx what what business do i have going walking into a a casting agent you know what i mean and and just but i was like you know what why not i'm just gonna go do it you know by and the I, way I, john huh i might have, i have i've been envisioning a potential role for you oh okay. all right well we'll talk because you know time. i'm also a, i'm also a writer i'm a playwright yeah yeah i have it it's right there on top there it says actor writer <laughs> It's right by your name. <laughs> anyway, I'm working on a few screenplays. And listen, John, we have to have a talk about this. Okay. All right, let's I do it. I want to see you up there. <laughs> I, I mean, I want to see you doing, I want to see your career really expand in that area. Well, I appreciate that. Thank yeah, you. And I think that, anyway, we'll talk. And I, I just think that you have a very special quality and you have a great quality of communication, which Thank I you. like. Thank and you. yeah, man. And you know what? It's like you hear people say this. It's about you got to play the game and you got to play the game full out. And then hopefully you might get lucky. You know, you're prepared when the opportunity comes for the right role that's right for you. Right. You know, and that's what it's about. And I've been lucky lately that I've been able to envision sort of what I think the roles are that are right for me. Mm to a certain degree and really put out my intention and really um, very clearly about mm -hmm. truly what I want and not just from a point of view of mm -hmm. um, my ego, but what I want, but what can I really serve and what can I do well and what could I contribute to in a, in a meaningful way that I feel is part of my bigger purpose mm -hmm. while I'm here on this planet. And I focus on these things, and some of these things have come to pass. I mean, not all of them, but it's like, and, you know, it's in a continuum. It's like constantly flowing, and, and I'm constantly putting out the intention, and, you know, hopefully things manifest. But I guess what I'm saying is you focus, you got to get specific about what you really want and what matching with what you have to offer. Right, And then you keep on intending and focusing on that. And I think that there's some fantastic roles out there for you, John. I, you know, <laughs> there are. I'm, not, I, I'm serious. Thank you. you know? Thank you. And I yeah. know you played some great roles and I've seen some of your stuff that you've done. Yeah. Thank you. you. Know, that, that. that was great. And this is it's about like, you, Michael. We're talking about Michael Simon Hall. Now, okay. <laughs> They, people are sick and tired of hearing me talk. Sick and tired of you, John. Okay. I'm tired of JHS. <laughs> but I appreciate that so much. Um, yeah. You know, one of the things also that uh, um, what you were just saying about the uh, the confronting is always a fascinating thing to me because fear is a real thing for a lot of people. You know, and I've I've managed. I think when you your upbringing kind of like does help on uh, whatever situations you went through. When I was a teenager, I saw some horrific things as a teenager growing up in the Bronx. So 
when I got out of the Bronx, there was really nothing that that I felt that can really hurt me, you know, other than, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I really, I felt a little bit sort of bulletproof in emotionally because emotionally I've seen the worst of humanity, unfortunately growing up. Mm -hmm. And when I, and so emotionally I wasn't going to be hurt by rejection, you know, like well, somebody said that. Yeah. And that really, I'm telling you, that really was a huge thing for me. And I didn't realize it till really not that long ago that I had that thing, you know, but fear is like a big thing. Um, I want to go into a few comments that we have here and then I want to ask yeah. you, I want to ask you about fear. Um, sure, give me sure. one second here. All right. So we have, uh, Paul Gordon, the third says, Michael is such an in-depth worker. Love the, love the work he's doing with. And, oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's my buddy, Paul. We're, nice. we're doing a musical together. Oh, I cool. May maybe tell you about that at some point. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Paul, we love Mike insight and passion. Uh, love shows. It shows in his work. Cool. Uh, Frank just says 100%. <laughs> cool. And then Sean says, we love JHS. Thank you, Sean. I appreciate that. All right. <laughs> uh, love Mike since I've oh, I already posted <laughs> that. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, that makes perfect sense, Michael. Focus. Cool. Yes, that is actually a, a, a um, an important thing. Focus is a, is a key thing. But, you know, talk to me a little bit about fear because it's such a – huge thing when i talk to people and i talk to a lot of people right fear and in terms of what like, in terms of everything i mean in terms <laughs> of whatever they want to actually do there's always a fear of rejection or there's always a fear that someone's gonna uh i don't know say something about them or post something negative i mean there's just this oh, tremendous geez. fear and now with social media the fear gets elevated because people take these photos and you know social media kind of makes everybody in a sense a little bit of a celebrity in their little in their world right because they have you know w when in history did we have a phone that we have hundreds of friends that we can send something to at the same time we've never yeah. had that in the history of of, of mankind so mm -hmm. it's become a little bit of uh of either stressful or it's become a blessing right depending on how you look at it the ones that it becomes a stressful situation is because it's it's fear. So like fear, uh, talk to me about fear and what what and, and someone out there right now that's just like wants to do what you're doing. They want to take that leap of faith. They mm. believe they have the abilities, but they are just so terrified of something that we may not even know and they may not even know. Jeez. Okay. Jeez. Wow. Okay. <laughs> well. <laughs> well, I mean. I mean, it, listen, failure is a big thing. I mean, no one wants to fail, right? Um, but failure, you know, I think it doesn't even matter if you're in this business or any business that you're in or anything you're doing in life that you're going to fail. It's part of built in to the system. Right. <laughs> it, the system is rigged, yeah. I tell you. Right. No, I mean, <laughs> seriously, you're going to fail. And, you know, there's that, you know, it's been said a million times. If you haven't failed, you haven't, you haven't, you haven't right. done anything. Right. Listen, John, if this inspires anyone, I haven't, fa I failed a lot. Okay. <laughs> I have failed a freaking lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. <laughs> okay. Listen, I go to, you know, I have to go to probably 20 auditions before or more before I get cast in something. Right. I have to go in and I have to give it full out every audition. And that's the thing is that I think part of the the thing about dealing with a few things, if I can keep my thoughts organized, is that one of the things is that if you're truly passionate about what you want to be doing and you feel it's sincere for you, then you get caught up in the passion of the journey and and that you put one foot in front of the other and you're on your you're taking the steps you need to take and you have an idea about a long-term goal but you can't get obsessed your your intention is for the to achieve something but every day or every week you have to enjoy the process of the growth and whatever you're achieving and that as you go along you're going to stumble you're going to make you're going to fall and you're going to have 
mistakes and you're going to have failures. And hopefully the failures are not too significant. I've had some major failures. Listen, I produced a show in New York that artistically was pretty successful, but I ended up with a huge, I ended up holding the bag for all the money. I didn't raise enough money. I was at risk of being evicted from my apartment for the next year. Every mm-hmm. single month I thought was going to be my last month in my apartment because oh my I was on the edge with my landlord month to month to month, literally living on the edge because I ran out of money for this production. And I ended up having to, I ended up paying, using my rent money to pay for the production. Wow. And then I had to, and I had to dig myself out of that hole. It took me like a year, yeah. you know, and that's a whole other story. I can tell you about that and, and what I learned from that and the mistakes I made and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But the point is, I'm not encouraging you to get in that situation if you can avoid it. But the thing is, I know the point is I've been in, I've been in some pretty fairly serious situations in terms of financially. And then also I've just had artistic failures myself, whether it's an audition that I, I mean, you could say in a small way, an audition that I screwed up. I mean, usually, you know, because I've been auditioning now for so long, I usually don't go in and give a bad audition for sure. Um, But sometimes I'm not quite as on as I could be. But when I started in my career, I used to screw up left and right in my auditions. I used to be a nervous wreck when I first started. And this is a long time ago, but um, so, I mean, I could go on and on about my failures, um, about, you know, whether it's acting or with my writing, my directing. I've also had business ventures and then some of them didn't go well and um, for various reasons and um, and just life in general. And but I think there's something about the fact that if you're passionate enough about what you're doing, if you really are and it takes maybe time to find out what your passion is and to um, give your time self time to explore things. But once you get find something that you're really sincere about, you, you need to find the joy in that. And you have to kind of let that sustain you as you go through these failures. And, you know, as you fail, you hopefully are assimilating and you're learning and that you are yourself are not becoming the failure, you know, you're just having a learning experience, you know, and that um, in terms of, and this, and let me give you an example of this, like say when you audition, if you're going into the audition just to get the job, you're setting yourself up for a failure and it's a misaligned purpose. Right. It's like, yeah, you want the job, of course, but what you really want to do is give a kick-ass audition. That's what you want to do. Right. You want to give a kick-ass audition so that they go, wow, he's really good. Right. I love how what he brought, how, you know, what he did with this scene. And then they, the chances are against you that you're going to get hired. But the point is you're developing a relationship with someone who eventually can say yes to you. Mm-hmm. Right. Listen, I get called in by the same casting directors all the time. It just hasn't been the right project yet for me. The timing hasn't been right or whatever. You know, all these variables are out of my control. But the point is I go in there, I have a joy in the audition process that I bring to the audition process. It's a performance, I get to perform. And I may have four different, it's not uncommon, I have four different performances in the same week. And it's like, I'm thinking, wow, I'm giving four different performances this week. Right. Totally different characters, different right. styles, different milieus, like different things, you know. And it's like nobody knows. Maybe some friends know. Maybe someone helped me prepare for a scene. It's all, my own little intimate private thing. I'm having these my little private wins of mm. going and doing these auditions and succeeding and knowing I did a good job. And that again, and, and to me, that's about the process of preparing for the audition, digging into the script, and and then all the technical things of logistics of getting to the audition. That's all part of it. But it's like being on time and all that, right. preparing yourself to go in the room and all that. And it's like, but the whole process. It, I mean, it is a process that's aligned with my overall goal, and I just try to enjoy that process as much as I can. And I know that I'm I'm not going to get the job. I mean, so to speak. 
you know, chances are against me getting the job. You know, so and you build up. I think the thing is, you got to build. You got to be have grit. You got to have grit, man. If you're going to be in this business, you got to be gritty. You got to get down and dirty. Or mm -hmm. just like if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you got to roll up your sleeves and do the dirty work yourself. And mm -hmm. you got to you got to get in there every day. And it's like so when I go to the auditions, you're when you're going through these actions that you have to do that sometimes you hate. You're getting stronger. You're getting more resilient. Mm -hmm. You're going in and maybe you feel when you start auditioning, you're a little bit more like you said, John, like you felt like you weren't as emotionally um, um, uh, vulnerable to be feeling the loss of like an audition because of the you said because of the way you were the because of your, you know, your earlier part of your life. Mm -hmm. right? So that it wasn't as hard for you to be feel rejection from someone in an audition at an audition. But say some people may feel a little bit of rejection. Well, you know what? It's going to hurt a little bit. But you know what? You learn and you're going to become stronger. Yeah. And you are going to eventually. And I don't mean you're going to build a thick skin where you become emotionally unavailable or become <laughs> insensitive. Closed in. Yeah, because that can happen. And, and right. a lot of it, young it, actors, it does beginners, happen. that, that happens. And it's yeah. happened to me, too, where you... You end up trying to protect yourself so much that you can't act. You can't yeah. be present. You can't be vulnerable. You can't be in the moment. You know, like, or it's, it's, it makes it, it gets in your way. Right. So it's, and I, I think it's almost like um, you have to be willing to gently expose yourself to the things that make you uncomfortable mm -hmm. in a way that you can tolerate. And you eventually build up a tolerance for the fact that you're going to get rejected. And the right. only way to do it is you do it. Yeah. You got to just go. You got to do it. Yeah. So, and, and, I mean, it, and it might be a question for someone as a gradient, meaning you want to be able to confront something that's easy, fairly easy to confront at first. And then you up, you make it a little bit more challenging and a little bit right. more challenging. Sometimes people jump too far too fast. Right. And they go for something that is really, that is just a little bit beyond them in terms of, their ability or in terms of the amount of, of responsibility they might have to take on or whatever, and that they can set themselves up for a bigger failure that will be mm -hmm. harder to, um, that may make it harder for them to get back on their feet. Mm -hmm. I think the thing is you set yourself up to take little steps and know you're going to fail, but fail, get comfortable to failing in smaller ways, and then you mm -hmm. continue, and then you can fail in bigger ways later. Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly um you know uh artists definitely have uh have to have a strong tolerance for uncomfortable situation and unknown yep absolutely and yeah. uh mike says uh i'm sorry uh terrence says uh mike is definitely a great worker and he's very thorough when it comes to his craft and i agree 100 <laughs> percent. terrence uh, and i did a show also together oh nice he's an actor Terrence, yeah. uh, who has been your so you have a question here who has been your best acting teachers? Who gives you inspiration? What daily practices do you use? Meditation? Mm, okay. Um, well, well I'm, I'm primarily uh, Meisner trained as an actor. Uh, Sanford Meisner, who came from the from the, the group theater. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, the splinter group that created all the great, you know, the it's like that was the 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 bedrock of American theater training and you know all the great teachers that came out of that um what's his name Bobby um oh geez Bob uh, blanking on his name but you know Stella Adler and 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 Lee Strasberg and 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 um some Bobby Lewis I think I'm sorry and um and Meisner and I studied Meisner and I went, I studied private. Well, I, I first went to a conservatory and I wasn't thrilled with the training there. And I won't name the conservatory, but I left after one year and um, I went on my own and I was still professionally working. This is when I was like 19. I was already professionally working. And then, um, and I, I needed to time to figure out what I really needed. And I found out that conservatory wasn't giving me what I needed. So then I was continuing to work. Um, and then eventually I ended up studying privately Meisner technique and with, um, 
who uh, one of the his name was Phil Gashi. He's no longer with us, and uh, he was a wonderful teacher. And he taught at the Neighborhood Playhouse, which is the home of Sanford Meisner and the home of the Meisner Technique. And it's a wonderful school, and I, I highly recommend it. Um, it's a two-year training program. And um, now, and I, I was invited after I completed my training with Phil to become a member of a workshop at the Neighborhood Playhouse, which is kind of like the equivalent of the, um, of the actor's studio used to be for uh, Lee Strasberg. Mm -hmm. where it was a professional organization of people that were trained in Meisner, where it was just, um, oops, my a light went out, but I guess, the, can you see me okay? Yep. It looks like it's okay anyway. Anyway, so I was part of a workshop for about 10 years, a collective of writers, directors, and actors, and we were constantly putting work up on its feet every week, and it was amazing. Wow. And that's where I really learned a lot by doing and getting on stage a lot. And also I had a theater company, and I co-founded an ensemble theater company. We produced a whole season of plays that we we solicited a thousand plays from all over the country from playwrights, and we selected them and we put them up. We raised the money. We we rented a theater for three months, an off-Broadway theater on Forty Fifth um, Street. I forget. Mm -hmm. And um, and I really learned a lot during that time about you know from being on stage, and also I was working professionally doing a lot of musicals too at the same time, traveling mm -hmm. around the country doing summer stock and regional and, and tours. And, um, but I, I studied mostly Meisner technique and I believe in, I, I, I follow the basic concept or the basic philosophy of Meisner um, where acting is living truthfully under imaginary circumstances. Mm. And this is a very simple definition that sometimes people, they don't really it's it's interesting. I mean, the whole art of acting and craft of acting is a fascinating thing that never ends your your exploration of it. But it's but this basic concept of living truthfully under imaginary circumstances, and the key is to live truthfully, truthfully and fully under imaginary circumstances. So the imaginary circumstances is engaging your imagination, of course, right? And there's so many layers to that and developing your imagination to be able to inhabit the circumstances of this character. And, and, you know, and that's a whole, you know, study in itself. But then you need to be able to, again, sort of like what I was saying about being on set. Right. About, for, I know as much is true. But when you then you come into the scene, you've done all the work, all the imaginary circumstances are set. And now you've just got to be present and you've got to be completely truthful and you've got to be completely present and truthful under those circumstances. Mm. And so it's anyway, I, I don't want to yeah. <laughs> over, over talk it there, but oh, good. It, um, yeah. I, I do love what you were saying earlier about um, um, really ex enjoying the process I, I think that people get involved into this uh, industry and they forget that the process is part of it. You know, you're you're in the business and that business of going on those auditions that you go to, those performances that you do daily, those are actually, that is the process that you're in, you know, and you can yeah. go a month without booking something, but you still have had process, you know, you still have had your little shows and you're right, because, you know, we only <laughs> when you're auditioning, right, you only get what is it like? How, how long are you in there? Five minutes, maybe sometimes, Not sometimes? Even. if you're lucky, depends. maybe I mean, it five depends, minutes. But right. Usually it's very quick. It's very yeah. quick. You know, so this is the only time that you get to actually perform sometimes for the week, you know, and it becomes a, a, a really strange situation. But you have to take it and embrace that one moment. And, um, you know, I was talking to uh, Carlise Burke. She's an actress. She was here on Saturday. And um, we were talking about auditioning and how strange auditioning really is as a, as a thing. You know, it's just a strange kind of because it doesn't really represent. It doesn't give you a full thing of the character. You know, it's just for they can see you. They can hear your voice. They can maybe see your body move. I don't know. Maybe if you smell. I don't know. They can just <laughs> get enough information about you. But it doesn't really say that this is the character but, that we're looking for, you know. But John, do you have the right smell? That's the question. Right, the right, do you have exactly. the right smell. One of the things that <laughs> there's a film. I don't know if you've seen this documentary, and I, I talked about it before, but it's called um the actual documentary is called 
that guy who was in that thing. <laughs> Have you ever I seen think, that? I think I've heard of that. Yeah. 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 So it's a really great documentary. And it just had a lot of character actors that we've seen in like a thousand times in all the different, very popular films, but you, we never really know the guy's name. And yeah. one of the, one of the, uh, the, one of the actors was saying about, was talking about auditioning and he made a, an a interesting point about saying when, when somebody goes into an audition to audition, you may remind the director of his brother-in-law that he loves, right? Or you might go into an audition and remind the director of his brother-in-law that he hates. So <laughs> you really never really know going in there, like who or what exactly you know, those people are, what their moods are going to be. And so it doesn't, so another thing, you're not going to die. That is what I tell people, you know, <laughs> if you're going to leave there. You can, I mean, I've, I've trashed auditions because I, I took them when I knew I shouldn't have taken them because I didn't have time to prepare, but I was like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to go. And I've trashed them. And sometimes I book like things that I, I shouldn't have booked, but they just saw whatever it was. I came in relaxed. I knew that I wasn't going to get it. And I mm. guess that gave me a little bit of a, of an edge where I just didn't have that pressure, but it's just right, a right. interesting thing. And that's about important. All yeah. That's to be to like to find the fun in it. I mean, yeah, the whole thing about auditioning, it's a different skill set than actually being on set. It's not Absolutely. the same. It's not the same. Yeah. And you got to get used to it. And the only way to get used to it is to really do it. And the only way, if, you, if you're not getting auditions enough yet, or even if you are getting auditions, you, I mean, you know, like, well, whether you're getting, I mean, at first you don't have an agent and you're just doing open submissions yourself and you get, and those are even an accomplishment to get called in when you're submitting yourself. But it's even more, you know, when you get an agent, you're still, it's not easy to get auditions. But the point is that wherever you are, you can always drill your auditions. You can always practice. Right. And it's about the doing this. And you try to approximate the circumstances as best you can of a real live audition. And I coach people. I, I coach actors. Mm -hmm. And I will work through them with this about mocking up the room and mocking up the whole experience like an actual audition. From the moment they enter the room to the moment they leave the room. Because that's the whole, the audition even maybe even starts before you get in the room and maybe when you're out in the hallway. Right. Because the, the casting directors may be walking by you and say hi or whatever. And you're already quote, so it's almost like your, your audition has already started. Sort right. of, not necessarily, it depends. But yeah. definitely once you walk in the room, your audition has started. The moment you walk in that room, they're gonna get a vibe from you. And they know whether you're prepared. They could tell whether you're prepared. They could tell whether you're relaxed. Mm -hmm. They could tell if you really have certainty about what you're doing, if you're confident. Mm -hmm. And they can kind of get pick up your emotional tone or like, it, you know, like or your disposition, your attitude. Yep. Like, your your you voice know, uh, went down a little bit, Michael. Oh, can you hear me okay? Uh, it's sort of like you're on a phone from the 50s or from the... Oh, in the 20s, it, I should say. Is it better now? Uh, no, it still has that that tone. I mean, I'm I'm hearing it. I'm assuming the audience is hearing it, but uh, I mean, I can hear you. It just sounds like. Uh, I was thinking. Uh, I, uh, uh, I, I raised my volume actually, but I don't know if that matters for you. If, uh, sorry about that. Is it? Yeah. Is it? Should I just continue? Yeah, just just go on. I mean, hey, we can hear, we can hear you. Okay, so yeah, so. Um, yeah, you have a mini performance when you walk in the room from the moment you come in from the moment you leave you have a two minute performance or a five minute performance right and right the only way to get good at it is that you practice you practice the hell out that's of it, it. you practice that's a it. lot that's it and, and you can get scripts you can get scripts off of breakdown services because if you have a subscription to break i mean not breakdown services but from from uh, Actors Access, you have what is it called, Show Facts or whatever. Where you get the sides; all the sides are there. Yeah. If you have a membership, you can look at sides. Yeah, yeah. You can see the sides. You can print them out. Now you're not allowed, like really. I mean, you're not supposed to be. I, maybe I should have said that because the <laughs> sides have disclaimers on them and have you know, like when you're officially given a side, has your name on it, like right. it has your name on it, so that people know that. You know, you're not supposed to be sharing those sides. But as long as you keep it to yourself, it's your own personal work that you're doing. It's part of your craft about you developing your skills. You know, if I was a if I was an actor and you want to get better at auditions, I would be drilling scripts every day. 
Mm -hmm. I'd be drawing a new script every day, you know, or, you know, or at least a few a week. And you, right. you get the script and you mock it up. You pretend someone just gave you that script and you say, okay, you've got to go do this in three days. What are you going to do with it? And you're that character. What are you going to do? Yeah. Force you. Create, mock it up how it would actually be and do it full out and commit yourself. And then, and you know, you, and it's just like acting. You're mocking up the circumstances, imaginary right. circumstances that you have an audition. So, right, exactly. You know, it's like, a, it's like a, it's an acting role within an acting role. So, exactly. Uh, you know, so. Well, yeah, it's an, a, it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting conversation because, um, you can always, you can always tell when someone is walks into an audition and is um, prepared, or so nervous that they're talking to everybody else in the room. And I hate that. Like, I, I when I walk in, I don't want I don't want anybody talking to me. I want to sit in the corner. I want to have my script. I want to have my my water. I want to go in. I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want them to ask me questions. I just want to go in, do my audition, and go home. You know, right. that's such a, a key thing, you know? <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's a telltale sign of someone that's not really experienced enough or professional enough. Exactly. If they're going in and trying to, like, like show yeah. the room, you know? It's, it's, so, it's, so, it's so uncomfortable, too. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah. I'm always like, shut up! Um, so, Michael, I feel like we could probably talk for, like, another hour. Um, I definitely want you to... <laughs> If you're if you're interested, I would love to have you come back again, um, where we can actually talk talk more about. My gosh, I mean, you you're like you have so much information and you're so filled with so much knowledge about the industry that I'd love to pick your brains. And it's you know people are really enjoying it, and I'm getting some really great questions from people. So I appreciate everybody That's who great. tuned in. Um, yeah. I would like to mention this one little thing if I can. Uh, yeah, John, yeah, absolutely. Before we end off. Absolutely. Yeah, I've been involved in, you know, talking about theater. I've been involved in this uh, production. It's a musical. It's a new musical called Henry Box Brown. And the reason partly I bring it up is because it's it's something I feel deeply about the message. It's a true story of a slave who in 1849 escaped the South from Virginia by shipping himself through the mail in a box. And he was and he went through the Underground Railroad and he ended up in uh, Philadelphia. Wow. And he escaped. And this is based on his life story. And uh, this is something I've been lucky to be very fortunate to be a part of for the past two, over two years. And we were at the Edinburgh Festival in, um, in Scotland. Uh, in, you know, it's the largest performing arts festival in the world. And we got a great response uh, two years ago. Then we went last year again and uh, got even greater response. And now we've been on a six city tour. And we were in our first city in Savannah, Georgia. And when, and then after that, we had planes for another city, and it got shut down. Um, but I just feel that I just wanted to share it because, well, firstly, for people just be aware of it, Henry Box Brown, the, uh, the musical, because um, it's 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 uh, it's growing, it's growing, it's evolving, and hopefully, it has a, a very bright future. I think it does. Um, as we go around the country doing these tours, we're continuing to work on and develop the piece. And, um, and I play an abolitionist minister who um, has an awakening, has an epiphany, which is kind of like almost sort of what is going on in society right now, where mm. some people are becoming more aware about uh, the history of our country and, and the injustices that have been happening. And we have, this um, we're going through this tremendous these tremendous growing pains right now um, just to say it succinctly and and partly that's what happens in this story but it's happening back in that time period where some of the people are trying some of the slave owners and the, the white uh, um, people in that area the residents in this case a, a minister is coming to terms with um, you know his own ignorance mm. and his and his lack of respect for his fellow man and specifically obviously um the slaves at that wow. time and slavery as an institution and and how he ultimately realizes it doesn't align with truly his values and he has to confront it 
and it's a huge and it's a huge journey and it's a it just a, it's a beautiful story and it, it just so you know it includes um one of the things that makes it so exciting is that it incorporates all the negro spirituals of the time period oh. and the, and the negro spirituals and they're done a cappella and it's amazing wow and it, and it's deeply moving and i'm telling you when we were in scotland not only we get full houses standing ovations at the festival but people are deeply moved by this by the show and it really resonates with them because it speaks to the truth of of the 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 right of dignity for all people every mm -hmm. all individuals and um and to take responsibility for our ignorance um and and so anyway i just hope that it continues and um Anyway, I'm I'm excited about that, and you know That's we'll see great. what happens. Hopefully, this fall will be around. I mean, we're supposed to go to Los Angeles, uh, Chicago, um, Boston, somewhere in Florida. I'm not sure, and maybe somewhere else. I'm not sure on the details yet. And mm -hmm. we're in limbo right now. But a, a, a shout out to Paul G, who was in the. Um, oh, did you see the video I sent you of the of the performance that we did? I didn't. You sent it to me in an email. Oh. About, I sent you a link to the BBC because we were on the BBC in Scotland. We did a little excerpt from the show, which is. Oh wait, I did see. I, I did get that. Email. I'm sorry, I didn't. I actually didn't see the the clip yet. I'm sorry about that. Oh yeah. Um, oh, yeah. but it's. You can see that. I'll and I could. You know, it's on my Facebook page. If anyone wants to go and look at my Facebook page and look up BBC. Yeah, I'll also, since I have the link, I'm actually I'll put it in the description on the YouTube link. So anybody want wants to see it, they can just go right there to the link um to the youtube yeah. channel on the description i'll put that in there because i do have it and uh, also i have your website up there um but i'd love to have you come back again in july sure. um and we'll actually talk more about that i think we'll open with that because i think that's a, a a wonderful uh uh timely piece as well it seems like you have a lot of uh timely pieces <laughs> um, that you've been that you've done which is which is uh, right. yeah. yeah very interesting so um Michael, I want to thank you so much for being here. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, we definitely will do this again. We'll talk way. I mean, we have so much to talk about. I know we can probably do this. I know. I, I didn't expect it to be this long. I just. Well, I always anyway, tell people that. People always, <laughs> people always say, well, I don't know if I'm going to have enough to talk for like 30 minutes. <laughs> you know, and yeah, yeah we're, we're like an hour and a half and it's like a piece of cake, you know. Uh, we yeah. had a, a little technical stuff in the beginning, but we uh, cleared up nicely and uh your 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 stories are great. Your insight is fantastic. So I definitely want you to come back and bring that to us. And I appreciate you so much for being here. Thank you. Yeah, John. Thank you. All right, and thank you from Sharon. And we got some uh, cool cool comments here. Everybody saying thank you. And uh, was awesome, awesome, awesome. So Michael, Michael, don't hang up. Just hang on one second. I'm just gonna close the show. I'll be right back with you. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you, Good man. Night. Thank you. You got it. All right, that was Michael Simon Hall. Super exciting to talk to him. I was very um, nervous in the beginning because of the technical stuff, but we were able to clear it up. I hope everyone got some value from, from that. He's a very experienced actor. As you can see, he's been everywhere, theater, and now doing uh, really doing well in films. Um, so check him out on HBO. It is called I Know This Much Is True, and uh, he's in episode five. It's with uh, Mark Ruffalo. Ruflo, Ruflo, that's right. And um, so, yeah, so check him out. Also check out his website, michaelsimonhall.com. Uh, if you like these interviews and you like what I'm doing here, please, if you're on YouTube, please hit the little subscribe button, uh, hit it, hit a like, and also hit the little bell so we can re be reminded when, the, when we go live um, as well. So thank you so much, everybody. I'll see you tomorrow night. I have uh, Jaylene Perez. She's a, a filmmaker, a Latin filmmaker, award-winning filmmaker. She'll be here tomorrow night to talk about her film. So thank you so much, everyone. Have a great night and peace.